good to see you guys. It's good to be back with my favorite Moms for Liberty. I'll tell you, I am here at, I will say this without exception, my favorite hate group in history that I am proud to join today. Count me in. It's a hate group founded on the love of our children. My two sons are with me here today. My favorite mom fighting for liberty is also here. She'll join us here shortly. Is my wife, Apoorva. I'm going to speak to you today as a father of two sons and as a millennial, actually. <laughs> I'm 37 years old. I was born in 1985. That makes me the first millennial ever to run for U.S. president as a Republican. Thank you. And I'm going to tell you what's going on in our generation. We are hungry for a cause. We are hungry for purpose and meaning and identity at a time in our national history when the things that used to fill that void, faith, patriotism, hard work, family, these things have disappeared. That leaves a black hole in its wake, a moral vacuum. And when you have a black hole that runs that deep, that is when the poison begins to fill the void. Wokeism, transgenderism, climatism, COVIDism, <laughs> depression, anxiety, drug usage, suicide. You think it's a coincidence that we see the rise of these same secular cults and insecurities at the same time? It is not. They are symptoms of a deeper void, a deeper hunger, a deeper national identity crisis that we're in today. And I tell you today, that is our opportunity as a conservative movement to now level up, to do more than I have even been doing. Thank you, Tiffany. I appreciate the mention of those three books. There I was pointing out the problem. Phase of my life, you have to be able to see the problem with clear eyes. But this is our moment as conservatives, as liberty-oriented Americans, to now level up and fill that void with a vision of American national identity that runs so deep that it dilutes the woke agenda to irrelevance. That is how we win. Yeah, somebody my age, what does it mean to be an American today? You get a blank stare in response. That's the vacuum. And it is our job to fill that void with something more meaningful than what the left does. I will give them credit for this. The left is very good at this. They will fill that void with a vision of identity. Race, gender, sexuality, climate. For too long, we've been complacent pointing out all of the endless hypocrisies with that vision of human identity. But what we need to do now is offer our own vision. If they feed our kids race, gender, sexuality, and climate, I want us to start talking more about the individual, the family, the nation, and yes, God. That is our vision that defeats theirs every day of the week. This is our moment to answer what it means to be an American today. We're not just running from something, we're running to something, to our vision of what it means to be a citizen of this country. What does it mean to be an American? To me, it means you believe, we believe, in the ideals that set this nation into motion 250 years ago in places not that far from where we are today. It means you believe in ideals like meritocracy, and the pursuit of excellence, that you get ahead in this country, not on the color of your skin, but on the content of your character and your contributions. <laughs> Affirmative action, goodbye. Meritocracy, we're coming. It means you believe in the rule of law. 
that if you're like my parents who came to this country 40 years ago with almost no money, I went in a single generation to found multi-billion dollar companies. That's the American dream. We should be open to immigrants like them who come legally through the front door, follow the rules, and actually come here to live our values. But it also means that your first act of entering this country cannot break the law. We live in a nation of laws. That is why I'll use the military to secure our own southern border. That is what it means to be an American. Thank you. Thank you. What does it mean to be an American? It means we believe that the people who we elect to run the government ought to be the ones who actually run the government, <laughs> not some managerial bureaucracy that runs the show today. That is why I've said that when I'm your next president, if you put me there, I will not just reform that administrative state. That's in many ways a false promise. We will shut it down, starting with agencies that should not exist, like the U.S. Department of Education. <laughs> we will shut it down. This is what it means to live in a constitutional republic with three branches of government, not four. I'll tell you, above all, our nation, the United States of America, we were founded on the truth, the pursuit of the truth itself. And what we need to do, what you all are already doing, which is why I love you, which is why they will protest you, which is why they will vandalize our events, is that we are speaking the truth without apology. America was founded on the truth. So what we're going to talk about today Let's talk about the truth. God is real. There are two genders. Fossil fuels are a requirement for human prosperity. An open border is not a border. Reverse racism is racism. Parents determine the education of their children. The nuclear family is the best known form of governance to mankind. Capitalism is the best system known to man to lift people up from poverty. There are three branches of government, not four, and the U.S. Constitution is the strongest guarantor of freedom in human history. That is the truth. We will not back down from the truth. We will stand up for the truth. We will fight for the truth. That is what won us the American Revolution, and that is what will win us the revolution of 2024. That is what makes America great. Our diversity is meaningless. Our strength is what unifies us. That is the American dream. That is what we are running to. And I thank you all for welcoming me. God bless you. God bless our United States. And God bless your families. Tiffany and my lovely wife, Apoorva, will welcome her on the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Apoorva, thank you for joining us today. Vivek, you always bring the crowd to their free feet. You do speak the truth. It's absolutely awesome. And I just want to tell you, it's giving us so much hope to see Governor DeSantis running for governor, right? Casey on the campaign trail. You see their three children with them. To see you and your two sons on the campaign trail has been amazing. So Apoorva, tell us a little bit about your family. Yeah, so aside from us, oh, I see them coming. There they are. <laughs> Uh, there's Karthik. He is three and a half. Karthik, baby, you want to come up? And then there's Arjun, who was born July 5th last year. 
Rocky might be taking his nap. <laughs> Hi. Hey, baby boy. <laughs> This is a pleasant surprise. <laughs> and these two little people are why we are doing this. This is, you know, we think a lot about running for president, our jobs. Those are meaningless compared to the most important job that you or I or any of us will have in this room, which is raising our children. I agree. And that's really why we're in it for these two little Little guys. <laughs> Beautiful. So you live in Ohio? Yes, we do. Okay, wonderful. And how did you meet? So we met, we're actually next door neighbors in graduate school. I was a, I was a law student at Yale, Apurva was a med student, and I literally married the girl next door. So <laughs> that, was, that, was, uh, that was how we met. But I think it was our, our shared values that I think brought us together very quickly, and we never looked back. And I think that one of the things Apurva's always done for me, oh gosh, thank you. <laughs> They behave themselves. Thank you. He's clapping. Yay! <laughs> it, it is honest to God for these kids' generation. A portable always challenges me. I think that's what has always kept us together is she pushes me. And she's the person who pushed me the most when we said, I said, look, Apurva, I think we're seriously considering doing this last December. Her first question to me was, are you sure we're not going to be in a better place when these kids aren't grown up? And 20 years from now, maybe we'll even have more experience to lead the country more effectively. And that was the right question to ask. And we talked about it for a long time. I think the reality is, though, I don't think we have 20 years we to work with. That's the reality. If I'm elected president, we're leaving office in January of 2033. These kids will be entering high school around then. And I'll tell you this, if we haven't fixed our country by then, I think there's a grave risk that we don't have a country left. And so when we think about our responsibility as parents, it is to create the country that allowed Apoorva and I to live our version of the American dream. To actually, this may be our last and only chance to pass that on to this next generation. And as a 37 year old, as millennials, I think it's our responsibility to actually reach that next generation, to be proud of our country again. It's a national pride that we have long lasted. You say he likes it too. He's That's very cool. proud of you. That's young lovely. Americans being more proud of the country. I'm happy to see that at a young age. So uh, earlier today, someone asked uh, in an interview to Tina and I, they said, um, what do your kids think about what you're doing, right? And so now you're running for president. You're on the campaign trail. You have the kids with you. I know it can't be easy. So um, any, I, I love to hear, you know, have you, is there, are there any funny stories you can share? What has that experience <laughs> been like? Well, we have a campaign bus, and I don't know if you can see, but Karthik is really into cars, and so that's his favorite thing in the world, okay. is a huge bus with his dad's face on it. <laughs> and I think it might be, or it's maybe one of two campaign buses in the country that have car seats. <laughs> and we inaugurated it with... Arjun here vomiting all over it. <laughs> sounds very appropriate. So it sounds about par for course yes. for every day, but <laughs> that's how it goes. But we, you know, this is such a privilege too. And we get to take them all over the country. They are we, every. They got to see the Washington Monument. We're going to show them the Liberty Bell. Yep. They're learning history, and this is really an amazing experience for them too. Absolutely. And I'll tell you something is. You know, we'll see how well this prediction lasts for the rest of our time on stage. But <laughs> we, go to, we go to, for Karthik in particular, he's three. We travel to churches. We travel to occasions across the country. He's a restless guy, restless little man. But when there's something important going on, right? Let's say it's a church on a Sunday morning. Let's say it's a temple that we're visiting. I, don't, I can't tell you exactly what he's processing. But he's processing that it's something important, yeah. actually and understands that I don't know what they're saying, but there's a, he's seen that flag many times. He'll tell you that's the flag of the United States of America. He'll say the words free speech, and I hope, I hope he understands one day what that actually means. 
But I will tell you, when they're dialed in, I would like to think that early on at a young age is actually when we start teaching these kids the values that ground us as Americans. And so it's been a privilege to do that as a family in this campaign as we have been. So you mentioned the flag. I'd like to talk to you for a second. We, Tina and I, and, and all of the moms across the country, we've got moms from 40 different states here, which is just remarkable, right? But the idea that, you know, we're going to let some places go, right? Like we're going to cede the ground in any area. We're not going to take any stars off of the flag, right? No, we are not. So, so talk to me a little bit about how you're going to reach across the aisle. How are we going to unite? How, how do you plan to unite parents? So this is the question. We were talking about this backstage, actually. And if you want to do events in cities across this country, I'm there right there with you. We've gone to the inner city of Chicago. I was actually here in Kensington, the neighborhood of Philadelphia, where, frankly, even many police don't go a few weeks ago. I think that the way we unite this country is actually by showing up first. I think that if I want to lead this nation sitting across the table from Xi Jinping, I better be willing to sit across the table from anybody else, regardless of their political persuasion, and actually speak in the open. And I think that we gotta practice what we preach a little bit. The other thing I'll say, Tiffany, is that I do not think the dividing line in our country right now is actually even between Republicans and Democrats. It's just not. It's between those of us who are pro-American, all right, who believe in the values of this country, who will not apologize for those values, who will stand up for those values, who will crucially make a sacrifice. That is what you all do every day in the risk you take. Make a sacrifice for those values. Or those who wish to apologize for a nation founded on those ideals. And if you view it that way, it's 80-20 in our favor, at least. And half the 20 are people younger than us yeah. who never learned those ideals in the first place. We'll bring them along too. And I think we win in a landslide style election like Reagan did in 1980. I think that's the opportunity in front of us. Look at this guy. This is real life, right? I mean, how wonderful to be able to see a family, right, running for presidential office and to be so real. So we appreciate it, right? Because we're moms. We know there are so many things that we juggle. I mean, talk a little bit about how you're balancing work and family and this campaign. Because as I said in the introduction, you're, you're a doctor. I, I, tell us a little bit about that, because I know it can't be easy. Yeah, so, you know, it is a little crazy. We, we've got, I did 10 procedures yesterday. I was in the OR, and then... Got, got dressed as quickly as I could, came home to do bedtime for these guys, and we're up early in the morning to get over and get here to Philadelphia. So definitely requires a lot of organization, and yeah. there's nothing like being a mom to make you organize, right? No, 100%. <laughs> yeah. yeah, multitaskers. We are definitely multitaskers. 100%. Yeah. One thing I'll, say, one thing I'll add to that, though, is we're, I mean, it is, it, there's a lot to it, but we are so blessed. Right? My parents came to this country when my dad was about to lose his job at GE in, when Jack Welch's tenure at Evendale, Ohio. They didn't have the kind of help that we have or support that we have. Their parents were in a foreign country. Our, each of our parents are involved in helping us with these kids, especially on the campaign trail and otherwise. And what did we learn from our parents is that my dad went through his version of hardship. My, both my parents did. But he got ahead and around it by actually going to law school at night for four years and ended up keeping his job that way because that's where there were job openings. Hardship is not the same thing as victimhood. Right. Hardship is something that happens to you. <laughs> victimhood is a choice. And so when people ask us how difficult it is for the campus, this is not, I mean, in, in a logistical sense, it can be difficult at times, right. but this is not difficult. This is an honor. This is, this is a true privilege, actually, to be able to aim to serve this country in this way and to be able to be doing it by raising two young sons and Apoorva and I each following our passion. That is, that is the American dream. We should not apologize for it. We want to make sure these kids have a chance to live it, too. Wonderful. Thank you. So you, the, one of the biggest applauses I think you got, round of applause, was regarding to abolishing the Department of Education, right? And you have two young children. I'm sure you're, you know, concerned, right? I know we've discussed your concerns about education. So what does your vision look like for education going forward in America? Sure. So not everyone is going to be in the position of doing what we're at least beginning to do now for homeschooling, right? We have a country to preserve for every kid to have the opportunity for 
I think, equal access to a high-quality education. That's not a Democrat idea or a Republican idea. So I'll shut down the U.S. Department of Education. I can talk about the legal and constitutional authority. The number one obstacle that they give you is civil service protections. I think those are not an obstacle if you read the statutes carefully. Take, for example, one, the 1977 Presidential Reorganization Statute. It says if it's to promote the economy, you can shut it down. Well, I believe an $80 billion saving back to the taxpayer is promoting the economy. I will act on that authority to shut it down. So I think it's going to require a president who cuts through what the managerial class will tell you all the reasons why you can't. One of the reasons I feel called into this is, and we don't like to boast about a lot of things, but I believe I have the deepest understanding of anyone who's run for president in modern history of how to actually shut down the administrative state. We will see that through. That $80 billion then funds underfunded school choice programs across the country, more than underfunds those gaps, more than covers those underfunded gaps. But a requirement for getting that money is going to be that the teachers' unions, write, the, the states, write their contracts in a way that stop the public school teachers from entering teachers' unions. So now the public schools are actually competing with the private schools. We have true competition and choice. My view is that if you're going to put it in the classroom, you better put it on the internet as well so parents have a chance to right. see it. Transparency, choice. That's now the framework for actually reviving civic education. It should not come top down from the federal government. It should come bottom up such that parents can be alert to if there's actually deviations from a civic education perspective, they have both the financial means and the transparency of information to be able to make their choice and hold those schools accountable. And the last thing I'll say, Tiffany, this is the first time I'm mentioning this, is going to be a key part of a vision for educational reform that's not going to come from the president alone, but I think can be driven locally, is that look at the amount per student that inner city schools spend. For example, in Chicago, $40,000 per student on average. Charter schools delivering double the educational achievement spending half of that money on a per student basis. Talk about uniting this country. How about actually taking that difference and if a parent chooses to leave that public school system, they can take the money with them. Yeah. You do the math on that. You'd actually have a $300,000 graduation gift waiting for that kid when they actually graduate high school. You tell me what the better use of money actually is. And so that's the way we've got to think about taking not only school choice as a word, it's a step along the way to the next step of actually how we revitalize education in America to be about achievement of students rather than protection of teachers for their jobs. Thank you. I think that's wonderful. Oh, there we go. Oh, Jay, thank you. Look, you have such animal. Teddies. That's good. Yeah, that's great. Um, would you like Quinn Karthik? There we go. Awesome. So Tina and I served on school board. It was shocking to us. You know, we, had, we saw things that were going wrong within the public education system. We knew the unions had too much influence and control. And then COVID happens, and we've got parents coming to speak, and they're talking about the harms that their children, or that they're seeing their children go through, right? Closed schools, forced masking, and quarantines, healthy quarantining of children. And the school districts, the government schools, and we have, right, government schools, they didn't want to hear it. And they shut us down, right? And then they called us domestic terrorists. And so we talk a lot about fundamental parental rights. You signed our parent pledge talking about that. Uh, Americans have rights that the government doesn't give us and they can't take away easily, right? Especially when it comes to you as a parent. How will you help us to protect fundamental rights if you are elected president? So the first thing I want to say, just as a side note, is to recognize you and this organization for making that the easiest pledge that I have ever been asked to sign. We signed it on the spot that day. And it's a clear statement of a vision, right? There's two visions in this country. Let's smoke them out. One is that the state, the government, determines the education of your children, and you have certain permissions as a parent to be able to access and participate that along the way. There's a different vision which is to say that parents determine the education of their children, and we will limitedly trust you to be able to be a steward of carrying out our vision for the education of our children. I stand on the side of the latter, 
And I think that it is a proper use of authority in the state level to hold public schools accountable for their failures. What I can do as U.S. president, and I should say this, we should not want all of the solutions coming top down. But the head of the snake is the Department of Education. Using the money of taxpayers as a cudgel to force a lot of those schools to adopt those toxic racial and gender ideologies. And so it's not just the school boards. That's a big part of the frontier, and you guys have done such good work in exposing that. But these these moms, I'm going to interrupt you. It's these moms that have done it. an outstanding job of actually exposing that truth, and I'm so grateful to you for it. But they're responding to incentives created by the federal government as well. And that's the job of the next U.S. president to actually step up and have the spine and fortitude to finally abolish and fix. Wonderful. Thank you. So we know that families are struggling right now, right? I'm a mom of four. um, I have three boys. And we go through eggs and milk like crazy, right? I mean, we will go through a carton of eggs sometimes in a day. Right, the 15-year-old cracks six eggs and, and, and makes them. Eggs, at one point, at my grocery store, were $8.50, approximately. $8.50 for a dozen eggs. They're back down now. But can we talk a little bit about the effects of inflation right now on Americans and what your vision for the economy is going forward in America? So I think this is something that's deeply personal to both of us. We actually talk a lot about the revival of national pride. And Tiffany, that is a subject I want to come back to in the next generation. But one of the easiest inputs is people tend to be more proud of a country when they're making more money in that country. And one of the things we've almost given up on, really, if we're being honest, both parties have given up on, is economic growth itself. Right? You'll hear debates about tax increases from the Democrat Party and even a debate in our own party, the Republican Party, since I'm, you know, in that party, about spending cuts and which ones we're going to, which entitlements we're going to cut, as though economic growth itself were not an option. We've grown at over 4% for most of our national history. We're at less than 1% right now. So think about that. What's the path from one to four? Drill, frack, burn coal, embrace nuclear, unlock American energy. That's step number one. <laughs> They've, they've, they've done a great job. Give them, give them a round of applause. Hey. Good, job. good job, buddy. I'm proud of you. <laughs> they did a good job. That was their first time on, uh, at a stage at an event like this, so I'm, I'm proud of them. They were great. They, they, they were great. You know, three, we're moms. This is the, the best The little guy's going to gonna turn that. one next week. Uh, July 5th is his birthday. And we think about the economic growth. It's not that hard to get there, right? Drill frack, burn coal, unlock American energy. Second thing is the number one obstacle to GDP growth in this country is actually finding workers. Any business owner, the top obstacle to growing is finding people to work. Stop paying them to stay at home. Right. We have a bad habit in this country of paying people to do the opposite of what we want them to do. Stay at home instead of work. Be a single mother instead of being married. Don't pay your debts instead of repaying your debts. If we stop paying people to do the things we don't want them to do, that's a critical ingredient to economic growth. Reform the U.S. Fed, stabilize the dollar, and then shut down the administrative state, we're back to four plus percent GDP growth. And that actually sets the ingredients for young people, especially to be proud of a country where they don't have to necessarily worry about whether they're actually going to be able to live the same life and quality of life that their parents did. And I think that that's something we have to embrace more in our movement. We don't just have some shrinking pie as some nation in decline fighting over how to split up the pieces. We might just be still in our ascent, on our way up, on our way to the mountaintop. I don't even think we're at base camp yet. And I think that if we view it that way, we can actually set policies that help us grow, including to grow our economy accordingly. Thank you for that. Kids in America right now that are in school are being taught that this country is broken. What do you think about that? When you hear that, when you hear, I mean, you have young children who aren't in school yet, but I know a lot of our moms, it hurts our heart, right? And and so tell me, when you hear that, what do you think? And and how do we reinstill patriotism and pride in America again? You know, my favorite thing about going to a Moms for Liberty event is the words from the founding fathers at the beginning, because they are just remind me 
why my parents left another country and came here because they knew that for me and my brother, there was no place in the world that could allow us to be successful, to be strong people, to live our values. There's no place in the world other than the United States of America. And if we give up on that, then there's no hope for anyone. And that's not an option for us. We've got these two kids. There's no world in which we let Americans stop being proud of America. That's It's a country we were founded on the ideas that we could pursue our happiness. We could all speak freely, that we could all think what we believe and not have to suffer from losing our friends, losing our ability to have a job because of that. And that, that's why we're doing this. And that's happening now, Vivek. You know, I, I, we had a training session uh, for our moms uh, the first day we were here, and they told stories about being doxxed and canceled, about being fired, about their children coming under fire. So look, I think that this part of what makes what you do so courageous, and I'm going to be really honest, I think taking a risk when there's no downside, there's no real sacrifice there. I think we value a nation that we're willing to sacrifice for, and you all embody that because you're taking risks every day. But what we're creating is a country where people should not have to choose between the American dream and the First Amendment, between speaking their minds freely and putting food on the dinner table. America is the quintessential nation on earth where you get to enjoy both of those things at once. And this culture of fear that has replaced our culture of free speech, yes, it has become an epidemic. But I promise you this, and, and I really promise you this, I, I believe this deep in my bones to be true. Courage can be contagious too. It just requires more of you, more of us, being willing to step up and actually demonstrate it. And the more you do, when you're the only person in a room who believes what you do, you have an obligation now, more than ever, to actually stand up and say it. And if you do it, 99% of the time, I can promise you that you will find you are not the only person in that room right. who believed what you did. That is how we spread courage across this country. And I think that this is achievable. I think that there is, you know what, if, if we're honest about this, Tiffany, most of us in this room certainly agree on the values that I talked about at the beginning. Meritocracy, excellence, the rule of law, self-governance. Most of us are here because we agree on those ideals and we're unafraid to stand for it. But take apart the last part, unafraid to stand for it. Now we just talk about who's actually agrees with those ideals. It's most of this country, most of your neighbors, your classmates, your colleagues, the parents of your kids' classmates. I think most of us also believe that they share these ideals in common too. But we can't be sure anymore because we don't feel free to talk about it. So once we start talking openly again, I think we will have an epidemic of courage in this country. As a presidential candidate, I'll tell you my story. I got my own LinkedIn account censored by Microsoft-owned LinkedIn, okay? I made some statements that were factually grounded about the climate movement in the United States, some factual statements about Biden's connectivity with China, they said it was censored for hate speech, misinformation, and violence. So we share something in common, <laughs> apparently, okay? But, but here's what I did. I, 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 we, we pushed them to answer exactly what was it in there that was false. They couldn't come up with the shred. We put up the emails on my Twitter account. Media accounts started calling Microsoft. <laughs> they then apologized and said that, no, no, this was locked in the error <laughs> as though it was a technical glitch. This is how we win. I was on with Don Lemon at CNN. He told me that I could disagree with him when I had black skin and lived in this country. A week later, he was fired and off air because that's not how we host debates in this country. And, and you know what? I was on with 
two weeks later, I was on with Chuck Todd, and I believe, you know, NBC doesn't treat us fairly, any of us in the Republican Party. That's okay, I'll show up. If I want to sit across the table from Xi Jinping, I'll sit across the table from Chuck Todd. That's right. He challenged me on gender. He said, how can you be so sure that there are two genders if you can't even define it? I said, well, define it. If you're a woman, you have two X chromosomes. If you're a man, you have an X and a Y. That's the definition of a man and a woman. And Chuck Todd is no longer on Meet the Press either. So I think that, I think that we're, I, I use that as a joking example, not to say that people should be canceled for saying the wrong thing, but most of this country realizes they don't want to hear from supposed neutral moderators that are really just vehicles for advancing a one-sided political viewpoint. So I think we are already winning because of what you all do. We just have to, have to have the courage to see it through. And I'll be honest with you. For me, for us, if Ronald Reagan were alive and well today, I promise you I would not be in this race. We would be finding other ways of having an impact in this country because he did that for us in 1980. We were in an identity crisis in the late 1970s. Civic pride is at a low today. It was also at a low in 1979. He led us out of that identity crisis by running to a vision, not just against something, but to a vision, to that shining city on a hill, to those values that define what it means to be an American. We're in an identity crisis today, and I think we have an opportunity to deliver a landslide election in 2024 just as we did in 1980. It's sitting in front of us if we're willing to actually step up, level up, and define not just what we're against, but what we stand for, not just what we're running from, but what we are running to. And that is that vision of the truth that we will speak without apology. Wonderful. Thank you. Apoorva, so nice to meet you. Karthik. Do you want to do a fist bump? Do a fist bump. Thanks for coming on stage with us. <laughs> Vivek, thank you very much for joining us today. It was a pleasure. Thank you, thank guys. You. Thank you all. It's a pleasure being here. Love what you do. Uh, it is with great pleasure that I announce our next speaker, Dr. Kevin Roberts. Dr. Robert serves as the seventh president in the Heritage Foundation's 50-year history. Kevin previously served as the chief executive officer of the Texas Public Policy Foundation, an Austin-based nonprofit, nonpartisan research institute, and the largest think tank in the nation. A lifelong educator, Kevin founded John Paul the Great Academy, a co-ed K-12 Catholic liberal arts school in Lafayette, Louisiana in 2006. In 2013, he became the president of Wyoming Catholic College. Under his leadership, the college adopted a policy of refusing to accept federal student loans and grants, let, lest it be forced to violate Catholic tenants. You can clap, that's good. We need to hold the line, right? In addition to his doctorate in American history from the University of Texas, Robert holds a master's degree in history from Virginia Tech and a bachelor's degree in history from the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. Roberts and his wife have four kids. The Heritage Foundation has become a good friend to Moms for Liberty because in this world where we are right now, we are a grassroots organization, right? We don't have a central office in DC, but navigating through the world of policy is complicated and we've had a lot to learn. Um, we're thankful for the Heritage Foundation, for the partnership, for the information, for the support. And it is with great pleasure that I now present Dr. Kevin Roberts. Thank you. You're very kind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thanks so much. Thanks, Tiffany and Tina, for, for you, for all of the chapter leaders of the Moms for Liberty. How about a round of applause for all of you? Thank you. You know, I, I do have to make this observation that you are the most cheerful, beautiful domestic terrorists I've ever seen. And that includes my wife, Michelle, who's a mom for liberty and a domestic terrorist who's here. 
You know, Vivek and I have become really good friends over the last few years. It's, it's never easy to follow him. And I, I told my son, Philip, who's sitting at the table, you are not coming on stage and sitting on my lap. <laughs> he's, he's a little bit taller than I am. It'd be awkward, mostly for him. But, but following Vivek is a small price to pay to be able to hear Vivek. And I hope, like me, you're as excited as so many Americans are to see more conservative voices, dare I say, younger conservative voices, entering the political conversation. <laughs> Together, all ages, we can send a clear message to Washington that the status quo is indeed no longer acceptable. I really am thrilled to be with you today, and first because any day spent with Moms for Liberty is a good day, to Tiffany's comment, and also because this invitation gives me the opportunity to visit this great city, America's birthplace, the cradle of liberty, so close to her birthday. I'm sure most of you are taking advantage of the trip to see the sites around town. I'm sure you've taken time to see the most exciting historical site in this city. I speak, of course, of the Rocky statue. As a child of the 80s, that is a historical icon. But across town on Chestnut Street, as you know, there's another must-see spot even closer to Patriots' hearts than the Italian stallion. That, of course, is Independence Hall. I remember walking into Independence Hall for the first time. I grew up on the Gulf Coast. It's a long bus ride up here. I was in the third grade. I was a fidgety third grader. I'm now a fidgety non-third grader. And I remember becoming still in Independence Hall and then in front of the Liberty Bell. And it was on that trip that I realized I wanted to be a historian, as boring as that sounds, because of my love for this country. And it pains me as a historian, as an educator, now as a policy leader, but most of all, as a grateful child of this country, that so few American boys and girls would have that same sentiment, even though it's in their nature because of what our schools have done and not done to them. This little clique that has caused that problem goes by different names. I'm sure you'll hear them all this weekend and you've, you've heard them, some of them today. The woke, the globalist, the establishment, the coastal elite, the political class, the swamp. My favorite though is the Neiman Marxists. They hate it when we say that. They control different industries and institutions from the media to the government to our schools and universities, corporate boardrooms. And that's really what we're going to be talking about today. I'm here today to talk to you about reclaiming our inheritance of 1776. And there's no better place to begin that project than here, where our founding fathers and mothers first stood up together for their rights, their liberty, and their new nation. History remembers that icon of Independence Hall for the grave, soul-stirring words written there. All men are created equal. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We the people. But it's a pithier, sharper sentence spoken here that distills the challenge before us. You've probably heard the story. At the end of the Constitutional Convention, as delegates emerge from their secret deliberations, a Philadelphia woman, one Mrs. Powell, asked Pennsylvania delegate Benjamin Franklin what kind of government the convention had given them. Franklin answered her, as you know, a republic, if you can keep it. <laughs> Dr. Franklin's challenge feels so bracing still two centuries later, not simply because we're gathered here in his hometown, but because today the nation born here just a few blocks away is increasingly misgoverned, misled, and outright attacked by a ruling elite that doesn't want us to keep our republic. In fact, they want to take it from us. Look no further than how our elected and unelected officials acted during the COVID pandemic. But for the purposes of winning back our country and keeping our republic, in spite of all of these attempts by the radical left to divide us, we must forge ahead. We must emphasize our similarities in spite of our differences. 
because we as Americans are the same as we've always been, and they, our political opponents, dare I say even enemies, are the same they have ever been. Today, we think of America's revolution, founding, and history as a heroic story about the triumph of the human spirit, the little guy standing up to the bullies, fighting for freedom against oppressors. But as you know, there are always some people who don't like a David and Goliath story. The Goliaths. In the 18th century, that was Europe's aristocracy. They hated the American Revolution and our Constitution because the fundamental idea of our nation is that here, the people rule. We don't need the elites to tell us what to do. In the 19th century, when France's revolutionaries insisted that freedom required totalitarian oppression, it proved otherwise. And when a new generation of privileged landed elites in our own country declared that all men were not created equal, America rededicated itself to the principles of 1776. We fought, we re reunited, and with malice toward none and charity toward all, we stood taller together as one. In the 20th century, when totalitarian ideologues around the world conflated patriotism with hate and equality with tyranny, America rescued most of the world from them. For two centuries, every generation of global elites looked down on American freedom and ended looking up at our success. Now in the 21st century, following this symmetry in history, the so-called Great Awakening is just the latest iteration of the empire striking back. From Washington and Wall Street to Beijing and Brussels, they are coming for our freedom, for our constitution, for our faith, and even for our children, all in the name of global order. They want to take from us our birthright as Americans. They say they want us to become citizens of the world, but in truth, they merely want us, just as in the 18th century, to be subjects of them. God bless you for rising up, for drawing a line in the sand, telling those who every day expect to impose their will on us, on our families, and our children, that never, 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 never will they succeed in doing so. Better still, you, like all of us at the Heritage Foundation, are tired of playing defense. Like the 56 men who had the spine, the spine to sign the Declaration of Independence, you've decided to go on offense. I'm here to tell you that every step of the way, in every fight, in every battle, with every hateful journalist, every protester, every attack on you, every single one, Heritage Eye will stand with you without exception. Don't ever give in. Not that you would. This weekend, you've already heard and will continue to hear about the strategies and tactics conservatives will need to defend ourselves and our nation from this faith. How to conserve our nation and everything we love about it. The speakers on this stage, as we just heard, for example, and in the breakout sessions, are among the most effective activists and conservative reformers of their generation. But you see, deep down, I'm just a historian. So I will let them talk about what conservatives need to do. I want to use my time to talk about what it is conservatives are trying to conserve. One of the best books ever written about America's unique culture of freedom is called The Roots of American Order by Russell Kirk. The Roots of American Order by Russell Kirk. You may have come across his most famous book, The Conservative Mind, which traces the history of conservative thought. But in the roots of American order, Kirk traces the ideas that make up the American way of life, and in particular, the four great traditions that led our forefathers to this city 236 Julys ago. America didn't invent the idea of ordered liberty. We inherited it from the West's four great cities of freedom that came before us, Jerusalem, Athens, 
Rome, and London. The first is obvious. All the moral principles on which America was founded and on which our society has flourished date back to the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, and the ancient kingdom of Israel. When our founders in the Declaration of Independence invoke the laws of nature and of nature's God, they aren't talking about Zeus or Thor. They're talking about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. From the Jewish people, the West inherited our greatest gift, the one on which all others rest, the knowledge of our good and loving God. All men are created equal was not a philosophical theory springing from the enlightenment, but a revealed moral truth. Men are not equal in virtue or wisdom, talent or strength. The equality of the American founding is our moral equality. As fallen creatures before a just creator who in his infinite mercy loves us nonetheless and taught us how to live according to his will. Human equality, God-given rights. These America owes to the God of Abraham, the holy heroic people of Israel and the city of Jerusalem. America's second inheritance comes from the city of Athens, democracy. In Abraham Lincoln's words, government of the people, by the people, for the people. 2,500 years ago in Athens, as you know, every citizen had a voice. Leaders were chosen and entrusted with power, not born or entitled to it. They served temporarily and subject to the will of the people. The people decided when to go to war, whether to levy taxes, and what public works to build. They were, in a way no people had ever been before in history, free. And from that freedom, the Greeks flourished. Classical Athens is as famous today for its ingenious philosophers, mathematicians, science, poetry, architecture, and art, as much for its political innovations. Practically the only problem the Greek city-states couldn't solve was, as Russell Kirk put it, how to live with each other in peace and justice. They disputed. They fought. They bled each other white in costly conflicts because cooler heads couldn't be heard above the din of the crowd. In the end, the tragic lesson of Athenian democracy was that without order, liberty was doomed. Weakened by war, Greece, once the flower of civilization, soon fell to America's third great cultural ancestor, Rome. What fueled Rome's rise from a tiny trading village to an empire spanning three continents? One of the first sources of their success was what they learned from the Greeks. They built on Athenian innovations in science, engineering, military, and very importantly, politics. The Romans wouldn't repeat Athens' mistakes. In particular, instead of a pure democracy, they established a republic. They divided power between consuls, community representatives, and the Senate. Each checked the power of the other two, harnessing ambitious Romans' talents to the good of the whole. In time, the system was so successful and generated so much wealth and power that Roman culture turned decadent and the government unresponsive to the people. The Senate gave way to Caesar and the Republic to an empire. As I say that, it reminds me so much of our nation's capital today. But the story didn't end there. Just as Rome learned from Athens, she learned something else from Jerusalem. Christianity, thank God, transcends politics. On the other hand, we have it on very good authority that Christians are salt of the earth. Their devotion always changes cultures, converts them, you might say. Christian devotion makes societies more just, more compassionate, more charitable, and more fruitful. Yet for all these virtues collective value, the revolutionary truth at the heart of the gospel is the innate, infinite value of every single soul. Thanks to a particular Roman crucifixion in first century Jerusalem, human beings today are not only made in the image and likeness of God, but can be redeemed to him. As C.S. Lewis said, 
As C.S. Lewis said, there are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. The revelations of the New Testament empowered mankind to pursue the good, the beautiful, and the true as never before. And the lives of the apostles, saints, and martyrs give us a roadmap toward them. But as we all know, the virtuous road, as it has been throughout history, is still the one less traveled. Human nature doesn't change. And men, especially powerful men, tend to pursue their own self-interest first and foremost. That leads to the fourth city that made America, London. Everyone has heard of Magna Carta, but schools today don't focus on great moments in history these days. It takes too much time away from drag queen story hour and critical race theory. So pardon the short history lesson. In the year 1215, England was ruled by an obnoxious thug. If you ever want to know how bad King John was, understand that he's not King John the first because there's never been a second. John was so bad that English kings stopped naming their sons by that name. Now, even a thousand years ago, corrupt kings were not new. Throughout history, they've been resisted and some of them violently deposed. But English nobles knew how destructive civil wars could be. So they took a different tack. Instead of replacing their monarch, they redefined their monarchy. Through the great charter, Magna Carta, they forced the king to put limits on the crown's power, established Englishmen's rights from that moment forward, and set the law itself as the true legal authority in England. It's all there hundreds of years later in the Declaration of Independence. After the poetic preamble about unalienable rights and the consent of the governed, the rest of it reads, frankly, like a dry legal document. It, it's a prosecution. Most of the text is a simply plain worded indictment of King George III's serial violations of the American colonists' rights as Englishmen. They didn't want to rebel. They just wanted the rights to do them as English citizens. That's why the American Revolution was, at its core, a conservative revolution. In other words, it's appealing to this continuity, this understanding of rights dating back to not just 1215, but as you now know, to Jerusalem. For example, Thomas Jefferson's first draft of the Declaration was heartbroken, heartbroken about leaving our British brethren. He wrote, we might have been a free and great people together lamenting the reality. But when London forswore its own heritage of ordered liberty, America claimed it for its own. That is the radicalism of the American Revolution, the transfer of that cultural inheritance from London to Philadelphia. You see, that's how Philadelphia became the fifth city, growing taller and stronger from the roots of Jerusalem, Athens, Rome, and London. It is the legacy of the five cities that American conservatives today must now fight to conserve, not simply because they represent our inheritance and the principles that make America exceptional, but because they are the true targets the woke left is attacking today. They are the precise things, I dare say, that got the majority of you active in Moms for Liberty. With every speaker they silence, every skeptic they cancel, every book they ban, or work of art they deface, including in the last few days, every truth they declare hate speech, the left hacks away at America's roots in Kirk's four cities. They want to overturn what G.K. Chesterton called the democracy of the dead, the bonds of faith, freedom, and fellowship we share with those who came before us, with those who don't look like us, with those who go to a different church than us. It's all our inheritance. And let's not kid ourselves. Their attacks have worked. Just look around. Look at the protesters outside this building. Think about the riots, the near anarchy that France is enduring. So we ask in 2023, what about Jerusalem's faith? A majority of Americans today seldom or never attend religious services. Prayer and the Bible are banned in schools where pornography is permitted. Churches are threatened with bankruptcy if they don't endorse same-sex marriage. 
Anti-Semitic and anti-Christian crime is on the rise. Corporations that mock Christianity, like the Los Angeles Dodgers, a terrible baseball team to begin with. <laughs> it's true. Are held up as heroic, while children are suspended from public schools for t-shirts that say there are only two genders. What about Athenian democracy? Ask yourself, does it feel like the federal government works for you or the other way around? A close look at our justice system might offer an uncomfortable answer. Athenian freedom liberated mankind to search for truth in nature and science. Whereas today, the left is at war with the truth about unborn babies, about the difference between boys and girls, about climate change, about masks and school closures, about the origins of COVID-19. What about the Roman separation of powers? Today, all our powerful institutions have joined together in one uniparty cabal. The media, the academy, big tech, big business, big government, all surveil us, censor us, manipulate us, prosecute us, dox us, cancel us. Meanwhile, individual freedom is being subsumed into the creepy zoology of woke identity groups. What about London and the rule of law? Look no further than our southern border, where fentanyl and criminals pour into our country. Look one block away at our crime-ridden streets with Soros-funded DAs, like the one right here in Philadelphia who refuses to put criminals behind bars, who doesn't want you to meet. You may have heard IRS agents showed up unannounced at the home of a journalist the day he testified before Congress on the weaponization of government. You already know, better than all of us, what it means when the White House ordered the FBI to investigate moms and dads protesting corrupt school boards as domestic terrorists. You see, like they have for 236 years, elites today fear American independence freedom, and heritage. They don't want our children to inherit liberty and truth because then they can't be ruled. They can't be bullied. They can't be intimidated or gaslighted or oppressed. This is why so much of their assault is aimed at our education system. The Marxist long march through our institutions in America has indeed been working. Jerusalem, Athens, Rome, London, they are the real targets of the woke's, woke left's campaign of bigotry and lies. The elites know as well as we do that faith, equality, order, and the rule of law are essential to live in freedom. And they don't want us to live in freedom. The reason they are fighting so furiously now is that in the last few years, the West has started standing up to them. Just a few short years ago, starting in Northern Virginia, a few brave moms and dads, some of them here, stood up and said no to woke school boards, no to woke principals, and no to woke lawmakers. Ladies and gentlemen, you are the heroes, and your work is spreading throughout the country in nearly every school board meeting in America. You are the special forces of sustaining the cultural inheritance from these five great cities. God bless you for what you do. A few more brief considerations. Consider Brexit, the 2016 presidential election, the leadership of conservative governors like Glenn Youngkin, Greg Abbott, Brian Kemp, Kim Reynolds, and most especially and hero heroically, by my friend, America's governor, Ron DeSantis. I like him because he also wears boots. The brave moms and dads who stood up for their kids and said no to woke school boards, no to woke principals, no to woke lawmakers. They are the heroes who showed us all what can happen when Americans reclaim their rights and their heritage and fight for their freedom. So are the joyful warriors of Moms for Liberty. And on behalf 
of all the dads and husbands and kids for liberty out there, once again, I sincerely want to thank you for your heroism and your sacrifices. As I said earlier, I'll let other speakers talk strategy and tactics with you. My heritage colleagues are here too, and they can, they can talk about them if you would like. I want to move into closing by talking about goals, the, the America we want to rebuild for ourselves, but most importantly, the America we want to leave for our children and grandchildren. It's a future of smaller government and more powerful citizens. It's a future of more marriages and frankly, more happier families, stronger communities. It's a place where we talk more and tweet less, where schools teach and don't indoctrinate, where we spend more time in our pews and less on our screens. That future we envision is not a dream. It is our birthright. Building that fifth city is even today just a matter of rededicating ourselves to the best virtues of the other four. If we commit ourselves to our faith, our dignity, the truth, individual freedom, our constitutional republic, and the rule of law, the left simply can't stop us. The media and the ruling elites can't stop us. History makes very clear that when people of faith and courage dedicate themselves to freedom and justice and pledge their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor to that cause, nothing can stop them. You see, we we, people in this room, we, this generation of Americans, we are the fifth city, the fulfillment of all the dreams fought for at the Valley of Ella and Jericho, at Salamis and Waterloo and Gettysburg, on the Catalonian Plains, at Omaha Beach, and yes, on Flight 93. It was the promise of fulfilling those dreams that inspired our founders locked inside Independence Hall during the sweltering summer of 1776. And that just 18 months later, very near the city we're in, motivated George Washington and his army to fight the freezing, life-threatening long winter at Valley Forge. How fitting, therefore, that you chose to meet in this great American city of Philadelphia, where the West once stood and now must stand again. Not to recreate the past, but to create a future, a future worthy of the men and women who have loved, labored, and lost so much to bequeath us the gifts of their four cities and worthy of the children who made us as our founders walking the streets in 1776 here would say, moms and dads for liberty. The fifth city is a city still shining upon a hill. And it isn't just our birthright. It's our sons and daughters too. It's for them that we must remember Jerusalem, Athens, Rome, London, and Philadelphia. It's for them we must answer Ben Franklin's challenge and keep this great republic, which remains the most noble, inspiring social and political experiment in all of human history. Thank you for being this generation's greatest patriots. And may God bless you, and may he continue to bless this great land. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Kevin, for that inspiring speech. I was sitting there enthralled and just thinking about everything you were saying, and I almost forgot to come up here and, and close out the lunch. So I apologize about that. 
Um, thank you again, and thank you for bringing your family, Michelle. We're so uh, happy to have you here with us today. Um, so uh, last breakouts, uh, the first 100 days in room one, Origins of Liberty in room two, and we won, now what, room three. Uh, so enjoy those breakout sessions. I hope you find something that you're interested in, and we will see you back here tonight for the Joyful Warrior Gala. Thank you.